good to see everyone here today. And uh, our guest speaker is John Whelan from Peoria. Uh, John purchased, uh, actually, John purchased a small virtually bankrupt company in 1994. And today it's one of the largest material handling companies in the world with a uh, thousand employees. Uh, in 2001, John started his first foundation, and this foundation uh, is giving 10% of the company's profits to benefit his employees' communities. Um, since then, his company has donated over $30 million to charities and non-for-profit organizations, which I think is tremendous. John believes uh, everything in life is connected, which led him to write a, a popular book, Uncommon Threads, Weaving a Life Through Family, Business, and Faith. And uh, John also wanted me to mention that uh, he's going to have books available uh, for you to take, and the only requirement is that hopefully you'll read it. <laughs> so he's very generous about that, but he, he would like for our Rotarians to have uh, one of his books. So, um, John is a master storyteller with a, a self-deprecating style uh, that provokes laughter and at other times tenderness. Um, you'll be glad you came today. Um, John will talk about leaders leading leaders. Uh, he's been married for, uh, to Julie for 40 years, has four adult children and one grandchild. So let's give John a nice rotary welcome. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I'm gonna do this just real quick. Can you guys hear me in the back? That's right. No, 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 no you need it okay. for the Zoom. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, uh, just to kind of give you a heads up. I um, I spoke at uh, Rotary Beacon. I spoke at uh, <laughs> Rotary Downtown last Friday, and I'm going to do a little comparison. Okay, <laughs> uh, what I like best about this place is you have more people here, uh, <laughs> and two, uh, you guys got good food. <laughs> That's, Jim, you, you win that prize. Uh, and uh, what I don't like, and I think uh, you guys, Jason, should think about that, is it's very demoralizing when you see people paying money not to hear me speak. <laughs> I mean, that is just, it's very hurtful. Most of the time people leave five minutes after I start speaking, not five minutes before. Uh, so, but I appreciate you guys having me today. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, seven principles uh, that I've learned on leading leaders. I want to tell you something about the seven principles. They are not the Ten Commandments, okay? Uh, you'll have another leader come up and uh, speak to you, and he may give his seven principles, and they will all be different, and they will all be just as valid. So this is not the all-inclusive list of leading leaders, uh, but it's some things that I've learned over the years. Some of you people, may be retired. Uh, these principles apply to you as well. In regards to the clubs that you belong to, churches that you go, your family. So I hope all of you will stay engaged for a few moments as I talk about these seven principles. So the first principle is to understand that your power begins and ends with the chair that you sit in. I'm the CEO of MH Equipment. 40 years ago, I was just some snot-nosed kid. And when I was a snot-nosed kid, uh, 
People didn't say, you look nice. People didn't laugh at my jokes very often. And they didn't think I was very smart. Over the years, as I changed seats, and the higher that seat reflected in the world's eyes, I started getting smoke blown up my dress, if you know what I mean. And so one of the things I want you to understand is don't get so wrapped up into how people respond to you based on the chair that you sit in. It's just the chair. Once you leave that chair, you're just some Joe or Jane trying to get through life. And uh, uh, what I also want to share with you, you can't let your chair be your core identity. If you let your chair in business be your core identity, what's going to happen one day? Those who are retired, what happened one day for you? You got out of that chair. And if that's your core identity, pardon the French, you're kind of screwed. I want to share your core identity really needs to be something that is alive and well on your deathbed. So you just need to think about that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is every voice in the room is important. If you're a leader in a club or business or department, you have to make sure that every voice is being heard. I always tell people, I do not want to be the one with the right answer. I simply want to get to the right answer. And unless all wisdom and knowledge dwells within John Wheeland, which I don't see anybody shaking their head on that one, okay? <laughs> and if my voice is the dominant voice, the chances are we're just simply not going to get to the best answer. <clears throat> so uh, when you're in a meeting, uh, you can tell whose voice is important or not. If you're the leader, does anybody dare interrupt you? If uh, you start talking, does everybody just become quiet? And if you start to talk at the same time, does everybody defer to you? If that's true, you got an opportunity to grow as a leader. If you start to talk, uh, you need to, at the same time, typically I will always defer. As the leader, you really don't have to worry about your voice being heard. You're the leader. Your job is to make sure that everybody, else, everybody else's voice is being heard and it's going to help you get to the right destination. With me on that? The next one is this. A private offense requires a private apology. A public offense requires a public apology. Now, if, uh, you know, Jason and I are in the hallway and uh, he's a Cardinal fan, I'm a Cardinal fan too, but let's say I'm a Cub fan, and we get in a big argument and I actually say something kind of belittling to him and inappropriate, uh, logically, I just need to talk to Jason and apologize. But if I'm in public and I belittle somebody, that's another story. About five years ago, my executive team, we were down in St. Louis, and the night before, me and Julie must have got in our one and only argument in our 41 <laughs> years, okay? If you believe that. Okay, so, uh, but I, I, I was in a foul mood for some reason. And, and I got into it with somebody, and I would not let up. This person finally looked at me, stood up, and walked out of the room. I looked at that person, I looked at Jeff, Jeff, what's that about? Jeff said, John, you're like kind of a jerk. <laughs> and I said, Jeff, but that, that's your opinion. Uh, there was 12 other people there. Well, what's your guys' opinion? Uh, 12 out of 12 said that I was a jerk. 
Uh, now, you guys were not here, but by a show of hands, how many of you guys think, John, you were probably a jerk that day, okay? <laughs> I mean, if it's just one or two people, there's a little wibble room. If it's 12 for 12, <laughs> there's not a lot of wiggle room. Now, I had a choice to break, go to the person, and apologize. I waited until we got back. I said, I need to address the group. Uh, Steve, I was a complete jerk, and I apologize, and I ask for your forgiveness in front of the group. Steve says, okay. Now, do you think my credibility as my team went up or went down? It went up. Look, I'm part of this group called humanity. And because of that, we have shadows and we stumble and we fall and we make mistakes. Uh, everybody in that room, they knew I was a jerk. That wasn't the news. What they wanted to know, John, did you know you were a jerk? And are you going to apologize? Now, those that are retired, maybe you think, oh, well, I don't have that issue. Well, we're still, still in families. And we had a rule in our house. Uh, I lied about me and Julie only having one hour every month. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if I misbehaved in front of the kids towards my wife, I apologized in front of the kids. They need to know that. You need to model that. Because again, they knew you were a jerk. They just want to know, Dad, did you know? And are you going to apologize? So um, the next one is uh, you need the freedom to fight. Uh, if you belong to a club or organization or a family, we all kind of want the same thing. Whatever the goal is for that organization, you need to be able to have healthy debate, go after it. And uh, if you don't, it's, you're probably not going to get to that destination. Now, I have this, this group. There's a guy on my group. His name is Daryl. Now, Daryl is probably the most cerebral guy on my team. He's well-read. Uh, because of that, he has an opinion on everything. And he also likes to talk. Now, your speaker today... He is not quite as cerebral as Daryl. I'm not quite as well-read as Daryl, but guess what? I have an opinion on everything, even if I don't know the subject, and I like to talk. And there's times where we would get into these arguments and people would just sit back and, and smile. It was like this, this thing that we went on. And uh, after the argument and the fight was over, uh, I had one job and one job only, and that was to restore Daryl to the team as quickly as possible. If someone went at it with the leader and they ended up getting in the doghouse for a few hours or a few weeks, is anybody else going to take on that leader? No. So when that happened with me and Daryl, uh, as soon as he said his next word, I would say, Daryl, that's a good point. Can you expound upon it? And if he wasn't talking, I would say, Daryl, what do you think about it? It was critically important that everybody in your sphere of influence knows we can go at it. And after it's over, it's over and there's no residual consequences for it. Uh, okay. uh, you can only give what you've got. Uh, and this is true for uh, business. It's true in life. Uh, what I'm talking about is this. Something happens every day of your life. You make deposits in your life and you make withdrawals in your life. And this is true in all of these areas. It's true with your mental health, your physical health, your social health, and your spiritual health. 
you just make deposits and then you make withdrawals. Let's talk about physical. Give me an example of a physical deposit, something that's good for your body. Gym workout. Gym workout. Give me another one. Sleep. Good sleep habits, uh, proper eating. Uh, what are withdrawals? Uh, excessive alcohol, okay? Uh, you know, a bad sleeping pro, you know, uh, a pattern. Uh, you know, what? Staying up till midnight or 10 o'clock or whatever. Uh, or like, you know, uh, we we had uh, we had uh, eight at Patello's. Is that what it's called? Patello's, or Patello's. Patello's or whatever. We brought in. We had those. Two big chocolate cakes. Oh. Now, I probably shouldn't have the third piece. Okay, <laughs> that was probably a, a, a withdrawal. Okay, so you understand the process, and it, it it works in every area of your life. Now, I'm going to bring it home a little bit. So, uh, let's say Dawn uh, is uh, in the desert, and she fell down, she broke her leg, and she can't get up. I'm sorry to tell you that, Dawn. Okay. Uh, she has no water and she's dying of thirst. Uh, she's literally dying of thirst. She's being dehydrated, and I come walking by. And uh, Dawn uh, seems like a very nice person. And uh, if I had water, uh, do you think I would give her water? Okay. If I walk by and I do not have water, but I really, really want to give her water. I mean, I desperately want to give her water. If I have no water, am I going to give her water? You can't give what you don't have. And so I'm going to actually have you guys do just a, a little bit of a quick homework assignment. I want you to read those four areas. And I want you to men, uh, mentally say in your mind, which one of those do you feel like you're the healthiest in? Which one of those do you feel, you know what? I've been making deposits and I've got a lot to give. Now I want you to ask yourself, where are you struggling? Where don't you have a lot to give? As a leader and as a human being, we want to be well balanced in all four of life's areas. And we want to have something to give to our employees, to our friends, to our families, to our club members. So just think about that concept. You can only give what you got. Are you making good deposits in those four areas so you have something to give? The next thing is this, you have to know all the facts. Uh, George uh, Bush gets, his, uh, gets credit for this. He says, we judge people based on their worst examples, yet we judge ourselves on our best intentions. Now, read that real quick. Do you think that's probably true about you at times? If Alan works for me, and he misses three deadlines. I'm gonna to go to Alan. Alan, what in the world are you doing? You missed three deadlines. You know, you're killing me. That's his worst example. If Alan is my boss and he comes to me and he says, John, you've missed three deadlines. What are you doing? My response is, oh, I didn't mean to. I didn't intend to do that. This and this and this happens. And so the reason why this is so important to know all the facts is we fill in the missing information with our own biases. When we assume we fill in the missing facts with our own biases. A few years ago, I did the, uh, I do a road trip. We got 30 branches. So I go to all the branches and we give a state of the union. It was in 2020, is towards the end of uh, COVID. I go to Ottawa. Me and my two compadres, we do not have masks on. We go into the warehouse. 
The seats are socially distanced. All 10 employees are sitting there with masks on. They sat there for an hour and a half during the presentation with masks on. Socially distanced, their guests didn't have masks. We move, we leave, we go to Danville and I start ragging on Ottawa. Those employees are nuts. It was spacious area. There was social distance. The next morning I'm in Danville. I'm in a room that seats 12. There's 30 people in it. Not one mask. They're sharing donuts, jugs of milk, <laughs> orange juice. It's a wild, wild west. <laughs> and I say, I love you guys. You're my type of people. We get done with Daniel. Now we're going to Decatur. And I'm back on Ottawa. And then one of my guys says this. Uh, oh, yeah, John, I found out what that Ottawa stuff was about. I go, yeah, what were they doing? And they're like, well, actually, they had a meeting before we got there. And uh, they knew you had your bone marrow transplant. And they didn't know how strong your immune system was. And out of respect and in honor for you, they, they agreed to sit there with those masks on for an hour and a half in a hot warehouse just to honor you. Huh. I now have different opinions. <laughs> Ottawa is by far my favorite branch of all time. <laughs> Danville evidently didn't care if I lived or died. <laughs> and we fill in the missing information with our own biases. Now, I share that story because that's a funny story. I could share 12 other stories where I filled in the missing information with my own biases, and it's not that funny. It's not that funny. So always seek to have full uh, information. The last one is this. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick story about the uh, rich history of Judaism. It was back during the Persian Empire, and this leader of the Persian Empire, the commander, he, he tricked the king into writing an edict that on a certain day, uh, all the Jews were going to be killed. And uh, actually, the, the queen was from the Jewish community. And uh, her cousin came to her and said, Esther, you need to go to the king. And uh, she goes, man, he hasn't talked to me for a month. And if I go to him and he doesn't receive me, uh, the penalty is death. And Mordecai said, well, how do you know you're, you're not in the time for such a place as this, uh, you know, for such a time as this? And uh, so she said, well, go ahead and pray. I'll go to the king. If I live, I live. If I have die, I die. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, Queen Esther went to the king. The king uh, received her, and the Jews were saved. Um, Esther was the right person with the right message in the right place at the right time. It's called an Esther moment. Now, I'm talking to leaders. I'm talking to people that have influence. And I want to challenge you on this. Sometime during this last quarter, you will be the right person with the right message in the right place at the right time. Go and find your Esther moment. So I want to thank you very much. Okay. Uh, what, what time is it, Jason? Uh, you got about ten minutes. Well, okay. Well, you guys gonna get out ten minutes early, or you can ask me questions. Can I switch your mic and you oh, go yeah. up okay, there? Oh yeah. Okay, that's right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, You're fine. You were supposed to uh, tell me the. Tell me.
I was waiting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wait until you finish. Because I told him, I said, if I didn't move over, Jeff was supposed to just yell at me and say, didn't you hear what I told you to do? Come over there. So uh, I did it for you. Okay, thank you. You're uh, any questions? Yeah. Mr. Whelan, what is your drive? Once the rest of us some of us. What drives you, Mr. Whelan? Ooh. Uh, when, when, before, when you started your bankrupt business, yes. what was your drive? Uh, what was behind your drive? Okay, well, I had one drive and one drive only when I bought EMH equipment, and that was don't go bankrupt. Okay, that was my drive and my, my, my one goal uh, 30 years later. Guess how many goals I have? I have one, and guess what it is? Don't go bankrupt. You got that right. Uh, and so, but in regards to drive, I, I, uh, I always felt like, uh, like image equipment, it wasn't a complicated business. Uh, it doesn't have engineering. It doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, R&D. Uh, so it's just, you know, you get, you align yourself with a good supplier and then you serve people. I'm not a complicated guy. And I always felt I audited that company when I worked uh, at Pete Marwick. And I always thought that that could be a little more profitable if it was properly capitalized and management was a little more engaged. And so uh, me and my wife decided, what the heck, let's go. I was 35 years old. I had no entrepreneurial experience. I have no mechanical skills then. I have no mechanical skills now. Uh, for some reason, Heister said, well, let's make the move. And I got lucky. I got blessed or whatever. And so uh, we, what drives me now, uh, I, uh, my wife and I were fortunate. We're not lovers of money. It's just a tool. So uh, we, we're not in it for the money. Uh, we got over a thousand families uh, trusting us to be good employers. And during COVID, we didn't lay anybody off. We had our technicians go to food banks and not-for-profits just to stay employed. We, in three months, we gave away over 11,000 charity hours. And so, uh, and then I get platform. Speak like this, uh, a, a month ago, I was actually in Perth, Australia. I was a keynote speaker for the governor's prayer breakfast for about 1200 people. So, uh, and so, you know, I'm a believer uh, in Christ. And so uh, I get opportunity to, to, to share uh, uh, his love uh, with people as well. Yeah. Yes, uh, you said know all the facts. Yeah. Sometimes that's very, very difficult. Um, how do you, um, form an opinion if you know you don't know all the facts. Yeah, well, I mean, you want to learn as many facts as you can, and you just want to be cautious about whole, how bold you are with your position. Uh, you know, I used to be very bold if uh, someone said they did something and sent me something a long time ago, I'd say, you did not give me anything. Uh, I'm 65 years old, and when people say, uh, I gave you something, I've learned because of embarrassment to say, I didn't see that, let me check. <laughs> because uh, there's a chance that I did get it, and I'm not gonna look like an idiot uh, by, by, by not knowing all the facts. So if you don't have all the, your facts, just be a little humble about your position and say, look, I'm not for sure I have all the facts, with what I know, this is what I think we should do. And then that gives you the opportunity, if more facts come, you'll say, I told you I didn't know all the facts, you know? So, yeah. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. So uh, my question to you is, uh, where, where does your heart come from? You're caring, uh, I'm thinking about family, uh, teachers, somebody out there had an impact on you. And I wonder if you'd share that with us. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I will say that uh, I'm, I'm fans of my parents. Uh, my uh, dad was a doctor, uh, and uh, he taught the kids uh, to, uh, you need to do the right thing, regardless of the consequences. So he was kind of like, you just do the right thing. And then I had this mother who was 
uh, one of the most gracious people I ever saw. And so uh, that grace and mercy, uh, 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 you know, found its way in my heart a little bit. And then also in college, uh, I came to a relationship uh, with Christ and uh, obviously uh, the teachings, his teachings uh, has had the biggest impact. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I love that your faith is such a big part of your decision making. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Like I know you have seven rules to, for being a good leader, but do you like stop and have like a three-step process, especially if you're like in trying times, like you said, with COVID and you're trying to make good decisions and move your business forward. What's your process for that? And how does faith fit into that? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I'll talk about faith a little bit from this standpoint. Uh, you know, with our foundation, we do support three areas. Uh, we do support organizations that share the love of Jesus or meet the physical needs of people in his name. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I, I think our cities are better off when there's a, a thriving faith community ministering to, to the least of us. I mean, but with a thousand employees... Uh, I know we have a tremendous amount of difference of opinion, so we support any secular good works. But we also do acts of kindness with the foundation. Uh, people have called us a Christian company, and I have said this probably a thousand times. We are not a Christian company. We want anybody of any faith or no faith to love it here. And... Uh, uh, you know, every two years we do a, a, a employee survey with 37 questions and the top three answers, which means our employees agree with it most, is I like the foundation. I've never been asked to do something unethical. I've never been discriminated against based on my age, religion, my race, my sexual orientation. That means a lot. But I do tell people we try to run the business. We attempt. We attempt. To run on biblical principles the logical question is what's that well it's this let your yes be yes your no be no pay your laborers their fair wages pay your stinking taxes give some of your profits to the least fortunate and there's a fifth one that people really don't know and the fifth one is simply this don't suck at your job and uh, it is a biblical principle. If you want to know where it's at, come and talk to me. And I'll show you where it's at. But uh, we we take a we're fortunate. We're privately held, and so everything we do is long term. We're not chasing a month, a quarter, or a year. And you know, so often with publicly traded, they're going to make a bad decision because they're trying to hit some analyst expectations, and they know for a fact it's a bad decision long term. We don't suffer. So we live out our value, or we try to live out our values, and everything is long-term. And so that's how, you know, I told our employees during COVID, it makes, it makes logical sense to invest some of our equity back into the employees who help create the equity in the first place. That's just logical. Well, sometimes logic doesn't win the day. Okay? Okay.